This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Mountain Glass Arts. For the month of March, Mountain Glass is offering North Star first quality borosilicate rods at 25% off. Just put in the code North Star at checkout. That's N O R T H S T A R. And for all you soft glass nerds, they're offering their soft glass COE 104 sale double helix rods at 15% off. Just put in the code D Helix at checkout. That's D H E L I X. And for any other questions or comments, please go to mountainglass.com. That is mountainglass.com. This is the Wise Guy Radio Show a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast, we have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 90. This is Jay Michael, your host. Thank you so much for tuning in today. With 17 years of experience behind the torch, I am as excited as always to bring you conversations with artists, sharing their stories in hopes to inspire and entertain while helping you grow your business. And today is no exception. Today we have glass artist Adam Dunn, also known as Crux Glass on Instagram and all the social feeds. He has been on the torch since 2010, but was first introduced in 2006. Uh, he has a fun story and tells us all about the trials and tribulations and really the hard work and dedication it takes to get your name out there, to find your voice in your glass, and also what it takes to go out there and do trade shows and continue to make a living uh, with work-life balance and having a family and all that fun stuff. I uh, definitely had a lot of fun with this conversation. Uh, he has a lot of uh, insights into himself and to really ways and, and ideas that he thinks that uh, those that are getting started or who have been in the industry for a couple of years and are really getting their now getting their feet through the door uh, can just keep the momentum going. So hope you guys enjoy this conversation. Uh, the next episode, also number 91, I am going to be sharing uh, the episode basically is dedicated to the top five ways to get yourself set up for a budget under $1,000. I've had a lot of folks reaching out lately talking about uh, the interest in getting set up, how to get started, where to get started, and all that kind of jazz. Uh, and I've been also been seeing some folks posting on the social feeds, uh, kind of complaining about the fact that they've spent all these thousands of dollars on getting set up, and after only being on the torch for several months, are getting frustrated because they feel like they're wasting their time and money. Uh, so part of that episode is also going to be dedicated to that conversation uh, about the hurdles and the issues that we deal with as you get started and the frustrations that you have to get over. Uh, a lot of fun with that. And on that same note, uh, just wanted to give you guys a little teaser. Uh, coming June of this year, I'm going to be launching a one-on-one -on -one mentoring classes. Uh, basically, it's going to be an introductory into flame working, where I will take you by the hand and bring you into my studio for a two-day intensive one-on-one -on -one class. We'll be covering all the basics of getting set up uh, between the equipment, you're installing, you're installing your studio space, your ventilation, all your lighting, gas setup, all the safety equipment, and also tools, torches, etc. As well as an introductory into flame working itself, uh, getting you to get on the torch and understand the medium of glass. Uh, one of the reasons I'm doing this in June, and it's something I've actually been planning since October of last year, uh, is because of the Florida heat, and I really want to get folks that are interested in doing this a really true sense of what it is and what it takes to be a glass artist, uh, dealing with environmental issues and what have you, especially here in Florida with the humidity and heat we have to go through. Uh, it's because a lot of us uh, that I've seen out there that get started get frustrated and quit because either they can't handle the heat or they don't want to... Uh, deal with the you know the glass or this you know kind of thing. Now, if you have an expendable income and you want to just do this for a hobby, then that's a little different situation. But if it's something that you think you'd want to do for the rest of your life, uh, I find it to be beneficial for yourself as an investment to take a class or an introductory kind of deal to really fill it out first before then you go and spend all this money on setups and equipment and heartache and then figure out all of a sudden, oh, this isn't something I want to do. So I'll uh, be offering an early bird special, which will save you a couple hundred dollars on the class itself, which I'll be announcing here next month. And uh, I've had some people already showing interest, so I'm sure this is going to fill up quickly. I'm only going to be offering uh, four classes, which is four weekends. So uh, there'll be available space for four people. I'm also offering a couples discount too, because I have had two different uh, couples reach out to me that have a uh, slight interest in doing this together. 
And so I'll be offering that too, which I think was kind of a cool thing. Uh, but again, this is going to be something that uh, we are offering a two-day class on a weekend, uh, which will give you a chance to come into town here. You'll get to stay with myself and my wife. Uh, we'll be also taking care of you and feeding you and all that good shit. So it's going to be a fun time. So I just want to kind of offer that and just give that to you now as a little teaser. And again, all the information will be coming very soon. Uh, WiseGuyMedia.com is almost complete. Uh, I just got a new a template basically through my WordPress that I found that is way more user friendly and functional and looks a lot better. And uh, now that I have all my shit plugged in, all I got to do is just open this template up and finish up the process and then hook up my newsletters and my signups and all that stuff and it'll be good to go. So we'll be creating a page for this uh, one on one mentoring course. Uh, also going to be launching our mastermind groups here. I am a little bit behind on that only because uh, I was not expecting uh, to get into Disney on a full-time basis right now. Uh, it was kind of a, it's, I'm, I'm super pumped about it. It was kind of a secondary thing that came out of nowhere. Uh, but I have become to a point where all my ducks were in a row and I was prepared to do that. But that being said, uh, I've had a couple of different artists reaching out asking about that. So I want to just let everybody know that uh, this mastermind group I'm putting together with a couple of guys, uh, we're going to be getting that started soon. And then I will be offering the, uh, the one-on-one, or not really one-on-one, but the mastermind group information. Uh, because again, the mastermind group is so important to get together in a circle of five and discuss uh, issues, whether it's uh, yourself, you know, personal issues you're going through, roadblocks, uh, your setups in glass and how to market your work, you know, just ways to throw ideas around and, and ways to get an honest opinion and feedback from your peers that you are close to. And the one beautiful thing about mastermind groups is these groups that I've been a part of myself outside of the glass world, uh, just in the podcast space and the business space, are people that I've grown close to and uh, feel that I can talk to them about anything. And I have. And these things that I've discussed that were personal issues of my own uh, really were helping me. They were kind of little minor roadblocks. And they uh, allowed me to completely get over them uh, just because I was able to talk and get feedback uh, from people who, again, I trust and, and uh, listen to. So it's kind of a fun thing. Uh, so I just want to kind of go on about that. And just don't forget also mountainglass.com forward slash wise guy. You can go there and then you'll see our little banner on there with them where you can save 5% off on their starter kits. Uh, their starter kits are already discounted because it is a group of items put together. And then if you go to the checkout after purchasing them and you just put in the code wise guy, you get another 5% off that. So just go to wise guy or just go to uh, mountainglass.com forward slash wise guy and you'll see that there. And then also they have their monthly sales going on. Green Flash Glass is also on board with the sponsors. And we have a brand new sponsor we are bringing on and launching, which I'm super pumped about. Uh, he is going to be a guest on the show as well to discuss himself as an artist. He is a scientific glass blower uh, who's gotten into the artistic side of glass blowing as well and is a tool maker, uh, makes tables and stuff. Uh, so I'm really excited to bring him on board and uh, share his story with you guys and also his products as well. So. Again, if you guys want to contact me, just go to info at wiseguyradio.com and send me an email with your contacts, information, and insights, and questions, and comments that you have. I uh, love all the emails I've been getting lately and uh, the influx of the show. If you are brand new to the show and this is your first episode, this is going to be a good one. Well, again, we are featuring Adam Dunn, a.k.a. Crux Glass. You guys enjoy. We'll talk to you on the next episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. Don't forget to go to Instagram. You can check out us out at Instagram. Uh, just go to wiseguy underscore radio for that page there. And also my personal page is J Michael Glass. And you can go there and check out all my work in the glass I do and some of my behind the scenes at Disney. You can also follow me on Snapchat. My Snapchat name is JB Firefall. And uh, I give you guys even more of a daily dose of my behind the scenes at Disney. Some things that we're really not supposed to share because it has signs everywhere that say don't take pictures. But you know what I say? I do it anyways because I want you all to see what's up. So just don't tell anybody. It's our little secret. So go follow me on Snapchat. And uh, other than that, you guys be good. Love you. Thanks for tuning in. And we will see you on the next episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. Talk to you all soon. Peace. How you doing, brother?
Good. How are you doing, Jason? Pretty good, man. Just uh, fighting a cold here. And I apologize to anybody out there listening if I'm sniffling in your ear and sound congested. It just, I don't know, man. It sucks. We just got all this shit going on. So there you go. Yeah. So before we get all kind of crazy here, if you want to uh, give us a little bit of your background, how you got started, who introduced you to the torch, and uh, all that good shit. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, it's kind of a, could be a long story, could be a short, but I'll give you the sort of middle middle version. Hey, man, uh, take your time. We got all day. At least I do. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I could. I like to say that I can really attribute to me getting introduced to, to Glass and the Torch uh, from New Kids on the Block. And Hell yeah. Um, I think a lot of people in the glass world will uh, immediately attribute that to Adam G. Um, back in uh, back in Michigan, where I grew up and I went to college, I got the chance to meet Adam G. Um, we went to the same school together, and he came into this coffee shop I was working at at the time, um, and he ordered a sandwich. And his thing at the time was uh, ordering random food, so basically you could make him whatever you wanted. Just that was kind of his thing. Um, and then he ordered a drink and he tipped me and he included a pack of new kids on the block trading cards, uh, in the tip shop. <laughs> and I was like, who is this guy and where did he come from? You know, I'd been working there for a while, never seen him before. So I made a sandwich, made his drink, took it out to him. And I was like, dude, I got to know what's up. Like, what's the deal with these new kids on the block cards? And you know, who are you? What's your name? So I introduced myself and uh, both happened to be named Adam, and I was like, sweet, man. He just seemed like a chill guy. I was, and I just, not much to put myself out there socially usually, but I was like, dude, you want to hang out later? You know, like, I felt like I was asking him on a date, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so he came over later that night and um, walks in the door, and he's got a little gun case with him. I was like, what the hell? What, like, what's this guy all about? And he opens it up, and there's this just amazing piece of glass. And he's like, yeah, I made this. Um, I was like, whoa, man, this is crazy. You know, the, all the glass that I had been introduced to before that, you know, was basically, you know, whether it was soft glass, it was vases and things like that. Or um, if it was pipes, then it was just your, you know, run of the mill, cheap stuff. And I had never seen anything like that before. So, um Anyway, we used that piece that night, and I was just blown away by it. And he ended up becoming sort of friends with the group that I was running with in that coffee shop that I worked at. Um, became just a good friend of ours, and we hung out in school. And um, I don't know, maybe six months later, a year later, he asked me to come down uh, with my girlfriend at the time to see his shop. So his shop was about an hour and a half away down in uh, East Lansing, Michigan. And so we drove down there, and that was the time I got to see a torch and see it work. And he let me make a little pendant, you know, with just this super simple technique of adding some color and clear. And um, I was just thought it was the coolest thing ever from that time that I saw a glass melt. Um, and so that was that day, and he showed me, like, he, he worked a little bit after he let me make that pendant and showed, like, made a spoon, like an inside-out spoon. It was the first time I ever saw how, like, the color gets inside the, inside the glass. And Red. I was just like, wow, that's amazing. Um, and then after that, I was, it was really on my mind, um, you know, through college. And I, I remember calling him one time and naively sort of asking him, hey, would you ever be interested in teaching me this? Or... You know, at the time, it just didn't make any sense at all, and there wasn't really an outlet for that because the shop was so far away, and we were both so busy with school and all that. But he was pretty open to it at the time. It just never wasn't really in the cards. Um, so that was the only time I ever touched glass until I uh, finished college. I moved to Minnesota, where I am now, Minneapolis, um, and was doing an internship for the end of my degree and working for this outdoor company. Um, and I... Once that ended, I had worked a couple odd jobs and helped open this uh, bike and coffee shop here in town. And I did that for like six years. Um, and during that time, the glass thing was still in the back, in the back of my head the whole time. And it's like, man, I just got to try that sometime. And I started doing a bunch of research, um, you know, online and stuff, figuring out what you need to get going, what you need to do to learn your first couple techniques. And actually talked to Adam again and he kind of gave me a good little starter um, thing over the phone to just as far as like a good torch to buy and a kiln and stuff like that and long story short I bought starter equipment that I needed and just started it just went after it you know pretty much by myself 
Um, yeah, there's probably some more details to that right. story. But what, were the sub, what, were, what was the first torch you bought? First torch I bought was a Bethlehem Barracuda, okay. which is, isn't made anymore. Um, yeah. You know, they got, they got the other models like the Bravo and uh, the PMTD and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it was. He told me this is just a decent torch to start with. If you don't want to buy a Phantom, you know, spend that kind of money, you know. And it it did. It got me through probably three years of you know, the whole first year was learning pendant, like just practicing implosion pendants and marbles and stuff and. I didn't really try hollow work until after about a year, um, but it even got me through, you know, making pinchies and spoons, and then all the way to bubblers and stuff. So it was a good torch for a long time, and I actually was lucky lucky enough to um, sell that to a friend that wanted to learn, and he's now actually working in my shop um, just a couple hours a day, working on that old torch, and nice. so it worked out well. Yeah, it's a great little start of torch, and that's people always. I've been getting lately a lot of questions, people asking about. You know, type of torches to get started on, certain tools and stuff. Um, so I'm glad that's what I wanted to ask because I'm th I'm really curious myself because like I started on a national when I did my apprenticeship and then I went to like a minor bench burner. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I wasn't really sure Bethlehem was around, but it wasn't really, you know, the internet wasn't around really much in '99. So to get around and understand who had what and what was selling and what was available was kind of difficult unless you knew somebody. Sure. You know, and I remember my buddy Daniel who taught me some of my my pipe foundations. He got a Bethlehem for the first time, and uh, I don't remember which one he got, but I know it was like. He was like super torch burnt the first hour after using it, you know, kind of thing. Oh, really? It had like a, oh, its own cooling system, the whole nine yards. It was kind of crazy, but it was my first introduction into Bethlehem and their bigger torches. But, sure. you know, it's always important, I think, too, to have that foundation to start small. You know, you got to start with a softer torch, a little less heat to really fine tune the glass. And the fact, too, that you start off with pendants and some solid work, that also is huge in getting a foundation to really learn your material, to learn your flame settings. I mean, all that shit. It's, it's just, you know, and, to, and also your tools, you know, and, and that, mm -hmm. what kind of tools did you buy? You know, right away, I, I bought my kiln and I just asked them, hey, if you have any like random graphite or anything lying around or, you know, any starter tools you could send me, that'd be awesome. And they sent me a few things actually for free. They sent me like a little two inch by three inch, uh, you know, paddle. So I pretty much started with a graphite paddle, um, a pair of tweezers, and then I think just one octagonal reamer maybe. Nice. Uh, that was about it. Um, and then the kiln and the torch. And yeah, I just pretty much started with that. I remembered that pendant technique that Adam taught me six years previous, and it was just striping a, a line of color. Oh, yeah, I bought like the um, sample pack from North Star that's got a little stick of each one of the colors in it. Mm -hmm. So I just had all these different colors to mess around with, and so I would just draw draw a line of color on that clear rod, fold it over, and twist it up. So you end up with like that, um, you know, that color twisted on the inside of the marble, and then you just put a little loop on it and call it a pendant. <laughs> yeah. Started with that, and then I found some online tutorials of, you know, I think it was from like uh, the Flow or a Glass Line or something that had a um, like a flower implosion technique on there so started trying that with solid rod and then pretty much stuck on implosion pendants of some way shape or form um, or marbles turning them into marbles and doing vortex marbles I pretty much stuck with that for like a year and tried to sell them to friends or I did a couple little craft fairs um, and like I even did a a uh, flea market kind of thing where I brought a little small oxygen tank and did a little demo and stuff and sold some pendants and marbles at that. Hell yeah, man. That's the best way to get out there and get yourself exposed, especially if you can get it on the torch at a place yeah. and do that. You know, it's that whole moth to the flame idea, and it's, it's amazing. Like, over at Disney, where, I'm, where I work on stage, I'm, like, right at, at, up front in the front door, and it's amazing how many people walk by and just pointing to the, you know, pointing into the store looking at me working, and then, like, five minutes later, they're in the store, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, it's, like, it's amazing. It really does draw people to you, and it's just the fascination of, well, what's this guy doing, this bright light and the flame and, you know, all this other shit, plus you're in there sitting with your sunglasses on, or so they assume it's your sunglasses, mm -hmm. you know? It's so, uh, I definitely recommend that to anybody out there, that if you can obviously get permission to do it and be safe about it. Um, I'm going to get into some future episodes talking about doing demos and you know this, this, all the aspects that you should think about when doing them. Because again, you know, it's 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 important to do that, but it's also besides the exposure, it's get yourself used to working in front of people, and that's not always an easy thing for everybody to do. Right, and that's something that I'm still definitely not 
um, versed at, and actually I have some things coming up where that's I'm going to be blowing glass in front of people for the first time as far as any of my new body of work or, you know, pipe making. And mm-hmm. it's definitely, I think it's going to be a big change of environment for me because I've just been in my garage or a basement for, you know, the past five years by myself. Um, but that whole craft fair kind of thing was originally, it's kind of what I thought I was going to do. I didn't necessarily out of the gate think that I was going to be a pipe maker. Um, and part of that was because I met this guy and that's maybe part of the story of me getting into it was when I was in Minnesota, I went to a music festival. Um, and there was a guy with a glass booth set up and I was like, wow, I've seen really similar stuff to this. You know, he had these really big marbles and vortex marbles and dichro marbles and stuff like that. And I remember Adam had made some really cool vortex marbles back in the day that I was just super intrigued by. And so I started talking to this guy, his name is Dan Neff, and he's from Duluth, Minnesota. And we became really good friends, and he actually sold me my first K-Tank to um, get work in. And he came, he brought it down to me from Duluth, and he kind of gave me a little lesson on a torch, on pendants and stuff. And um, from then, that was he was sort of my uh, inspiration, or one of the guys I looked up to, I'd, that I'd been doing it for a long time, or for a while at the time. And I was like, well, maybe I should do this craft fair kind of gig because he travels around all summer um, doing craft fairs and art shows and, you know, even like the um, American Craft Council shows and he's in some of those bigger ones. And um, now he owns a gallery up in Duluth, so he's really into that sort of art side of it. And so I thought I was going to do that. But then once I got into the pipe thing, it was just like, this is so limitless and it's got this whole other side to it that was really drew me away from doing the you know just the non-functional stuff so yeah it's interesting to say that man because i know like there's there's a lot of politics involved in the pipe community just you know besides all the laws you know just whatever right uh, there's definitely seems to be a lot more politic in the art in the fine art world out there and like talking to steve sizelove a couple you know back episodes back and he was discussing that same thing like he was just tired of going to meetings and having artists that were like their shit doesn't stink and they're the best glass artist or artist in period in the world. And it was like the whole group of them were like that, you know? And he's like, I can't deal with this bullshit, this kind of facade of these fake people that are just, you know, think their shit doesn't stink. And then you get into our community and it's like, everybody wants to be friends and share stuff. And then I can't say everybody cause not everybody does, but the majority of us are so open where it's just become this big family, mm-hmm. you know? And it's the dynamic of that is so different. I find than the other communities out there I guess in a sense in the art world you know it's, it's interesting yeah yeah and you know those those art shows and stuff they're really stickler too and it's kind of like the pipe industry especially with the shows and stuff it's kind of like once you get in then you're in you know mm-hmm. it's like you sort of went through the, the stuff in the beginning whether you had to get down a waiting list or you know just prove yourself as far as your skill but then you're kind of like they give you your booth next year and not give it to you, but you sort of like guaranteed a spot if you want it. Right. Whereas the art shows, you got to get like jury every year and you you can, you can work a craft show for five years straight. And then all of a sudden they don't let you in the next year. And it's like, wait a second, I have a whole client base around this area and stuff that come to this show and expect to see me there. And then all of a sudden I'm not allowed to. <laughs> yeah. Know, so yeah. We deal with that here ourselves. Uh, we have a, a couple of big main like nationally known shows and uh, we've got, our little core group of artists locally here that have been doing the shows for 30 plus years before our community here really started growing. And once a couple of us really started getting, trying to get into these shows, they were almost like banning us from them because these other people had their foot in the door already. And they were really, you know, implementing the whole, no, we don't want them in here because we've been here and we don't want the competition or, you know, whatever kind of bullshit, Yeah, <clears throat> which is stupid, you know, we're like, you're saying like, you know, the trade shows for our industry, it's a little different. They're like, yeah, please, Let's see what you got. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it, it, our industry, the trade shows, it seems like even if if you can't get into maybe the main room or something, there's always space. There's always they're they're doing everything to just keep growing it to make sure that it's all inclusive kind of thing. But yeah, yeah, it's a little bit different. Yeah, I heard just whole kinda, different world. Yeah, I agree. And I had I had heard just from several different people that weren't artists that were there that were bending or that are big names in our industry um that you know they're finding like these trade shows are becoming more like popularity contests almost like but i guess what the thing was is that they were saying like the artists were segmented into different types of classifications like the ballers and then like the 
advanced artists and then like the intermediate and then the beginners and they were kind of like segmented in their own little groups in a sense and like segregation almost but the people that were being segregated they weren't happy that they were segregated you know so i'm finding like from things i'm hearing out there that people aren't really happy with the trend that that the trade shows are taking so hopefully the trade shows can can listen to the community and, and understand that they don't want to be segmented i get what they're trying to do but you know, it's, it doesn't work. People don't want to be involved with these things if they're going to be segment. you know, if they're going to be like that segregation going on. We want to be part of it because we all want to be a part of the family. And I get it, but at the same time, there's got to be something done to really open it up just so people aren't feeling left out so that the, the new guys aren't over in the corner that nobody's going to go see, you know, kind of thing, kind of set up. So it's, it's, sure. it's fascinating. You know? Yeah, I think it depends on what show you go to as well. You know, it's like, I th probably what you're referring to is the American Glass Expo, and yeah, yeah. Especially, especially the one in Vegas. But yeah. you know, I've been doing the Denver one for the past year, and we're all in the same same room. Um, I think what it is is the the channel, and same with Glassroots. It's all just one big room, and it's all just you know everybody's together. Um, and I think what the problem with, and not the problem, but maybe the um, the challenge with uh, Vegas January American Glass Expo is simply that it's huge, and they the the organizers are trying to accommodate the glass floors, but they're also trying to accommodate the organizers and the um, or the venue. And you know, this year the venue had to change, um, and so they're constantly trying to battle with these people of like them not necessarily being prepared for what's going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. And so whether that's taking over an entire tower of show of sleeping rooms and turning those into showrooms, and then also using their both of their convention center rooms. Um, and I think there was this year there was a lot of challenges and there was a lot of people that weren't happy. But you just got to remember that nobody really knows what they're doing yet because this is all pretty new. And especially when you have to change venues, there's going to be a lot of different things that come up. Um, and then also there's sure there's that uh, that sort of feeling of ex exclusivity or whatever in the main room. But it's 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 kind of goes with the trend of the industry. And mm -hmm. I think that it, it does make sense, especially because the store owners and the gallery owners, they do want a chance at those, those pieces that are um, going to be really hard to get unless they're there right away. And what they're doing is they're paying extra money to go see a preview of that, of that room. And I understand when you're not in that room, cause I wasn't in that room last year. I was in that room this year. Um, but last year I wasn't, and I understand you're, you're there on the first night and there wasn't a whole lot of communication as far as we didn't realize that we weren't even a part of the first night and that we weren't even allowed into that other room as artists. Um, so it was a little bit frustrating just with communication, but once you realized what they were trying to do, it, it, it made sense. And then the weekend ended up being just fine as long as you are doing things to attract people to your booth. And, you know, if your art's worth attracting, then it's, they're going to be there and, mm -hmm. Um, I, as far as what I can tell, anybody that's there with positive attitude and bringing good work, it's it's good for everybody. I mean, I haven't really talked to anybody. People get worried the first couple of days because, or the first day maybe because everybody is in that big room or the main room. Um, but then they start trickling out when they realize they can't afford everything in that room. They start going around to everything else, you yeah, know, yeah. and then everybody gets the love too. Yeah, and that's yeah. why I wanted to bring it up because I my, myself personally have not done the trade shows yet, and I do I do want to go do them. Um, I think more or less I want to go do them at first just to, as a spectator in a sense, and also as media for the show. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, you know, take advantage of it in a sense. But you know, like I I had heard through the grapevine that Hard Rock was again wasn't like you're saying was not expecting what we brought to to them, and that supposedly next year that uh, they haven't they're not welcoming us back because they couldn't handle us. Oh, and, is that right? <laughs> yeah, and there I guess what I had heard from what I hear, and I don't want to spread rumors or anything, so this is all just speculation. You know, yeah. I, we were laughing about it because they, you know, our industry and the artists that are in it are more or less we're all kind of, you know, kind of uh, introverted in our shops, you know, staying to ourselves. But when you get us all together and like watch the fuck out, you know, we all break loose and let it, you know, and have a good time. And they were saying that last before our, our convention, they had like the porn industry was there for their awards and all that shit. And they're like, we could handle them, but we couldn't handle you guys. And I, I don't know if it was because of all the, the token going on or what the fuck, but they basically said that they couldn't handle us, which is, I think was hilarious because we are a bunch of crazy motherfuckers when it comes down to it. But again, we're all so introverted in a sense and don't want to do things. You know, like I was saying before they recorded, you know, it's been having trouble getting people on the show because people don't want to necessarily get out there and 
expose ourselves or they feel awkward, you know, being recorded. Yeah. Um, so I just thought it was very humorous that the hard rock in Vegas couldn't handle the pipe industry. You know? <laughs> it's just so funny. So I'm kind of curious, you know, it's, again, speculation if we're going to be there again next year or if they're going to find us another place. But then back to what you're saying, too, about like the growing pains we're going through. I completely agree. I mean, it's like for myself personally with the show, even it's a brand new thing for myself. It's brand new in a sense for this industry and trying to figure out how to make this work to benefit everybody. <clears throat> and to get people on a different mindset. Like I just changed the name of my show the other day to the, the subtitle to where my focus is really now, like helping the, the glass artist become an artistic entrepreneur mm -hmm. and, and not just thinking about being an artist, but thinking about running your business successfully. Um, but there's so many different facets of it, you know? So it's, it's, it's fun that we're all realizing that we are growing, that laws are changing and that we all got to take it seriously because we're going to be left behind if you're not, you know? And then like you're saying with the trade shows, it's, it seems like the the pre trade shows you really got to market yourself and promote yourself that you're going to in fact be at these trade shows what booth you're in where you're going to be at your location even if you have like a map of maybe what the venue is going to be you know like all that stuff is so important especially if you're not a part of the baller section that very first where you got the the pre invite opening night kind of thing you're not a part of that so Right. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. So and, and the trade shows yourself, like, have you found them to be successful for yourself in, in terms of selling your glass there and then also getting orders on top of that? Yeah, um, I have, you know, it's been so I, I did my first trade show was Glassroots. Uh, let's see. Uh, this, I did it for my third time. So, yeah, three years ago, I did my first Glassroots and that was when I was still working full time. Um, at my day job, like I didn't, I didn't go full time glass until like a year and a half ago. Um, so I actually did my first trade show um, while I was working full time. I don't know that that's the best thing to do, but um, it's it was a way for me to kind of gauge how successful this thing was going to be um, and try to be smart about it. Um, and so, yeah, from, but from that point on that first trade show, I was really, all I was looking to do was just cover my costs. You know, I didn't really have any expectations, but I, I just immediately started getting orders. And that's what I did was I had my, you know, the glass there to sell, but then I also took orders and I was immediately getting orders and I had no idea what to do. I was like, uh, do you want to make a down payment? And the guy just looked at me super funny and he you know, was like, okay, apparently you don't do that. And I was just like totally learning it on the fly. Um, but yeah, from that point on, I've done Glassroots and the American Glass Expo for the past two years. I've done all three of them, um, one of them being in the mid-show in Denver for the American Glass, Blow, or Glass Expo, and then the January aid show um, in Vegas. And then this year, they're not doing the Denver show. They're doing it in Texas. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what I can say about those shows is that they are very expensive. Um, the cost on top of just the booth fee is, is going to set you back. So you got to take that all into account. But basically what I was doing was I was using it as a promotion tool because nobody knew, knew who I was and a lot of people still don't know who I am. And that's fine. And I think that's the natural order of it. Um, but what it did was allowed me to get my name out to a mass group of people who had never seen my stuff before. And also it allowed me to sell this stuff at a really reasonable price, um, which again, maybe for better or for worse, after that first glass route show, I had to make a ton of stuff at way too low of a price. And it kind of was a real challenge for me, but I didn't really make any money off of it in that sense, but it got my name out to this whole group of people who had never heard of me before. Um, and was just the sort of start of my, of my career at that point. I went down in hours at my day job, uh, down to like three days a week. And then like six months later, I went down to one day a week. Fortunately, I had an awesome boss who I, I was sort of the, a part of the beginning of this business that opened. And he was, I was living with him at the time when we opened that business. And also when I started blowing glass and he let me uh, set up a little bench in his basement, which was without that, I don't know if I would have ever started it. Um, but yeah, that, uh, he let me sort of slowly get out of there and transfer. He was, he was really supportive in me becoming an artist. And so he let me slowly transfer over to being a full-time glassblower until I held on to that one day a week for maybe a year or so, because I just had a hard time emotionally letting go of the place, I guess. But, 
it just didn't make any sense anymore with the orders I had and stuff coming in. Um, yeah. To keep it. yeah, that's good, man. It's, you know, almost having like a mentor in a sense like that, someone that's really got your back. And it's, you know, no matter, I think all of us need that, whether it's, you know, a family, a friend, you know, someone that's a professional in a different industry. But, you know, just in general to have someone that's got your back and supporting you saying, yeah, man, you can do this, you know, especially in that situation, especially when it's like, you know, quote unquote, your boss, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's pretty rad. So kind of back up to the trade shows. So since you have had the experience with them, you know, you're saying about, you know, asking for deposits, do you require deposits now from shops or did you have any issues from their first trade shows of saying, you know, a shop saying, yeah, I want 10 of these and then you get them made and they're like, oh, no, I don't want those fucking things. Like, have you had any issues with that or, you know, and had to fine tune the way you do things? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I have had some shops back out, but the way I look at it is, well, to answer your first question, no, I don't take a deposit because I realize that nobody takes a deposit. And if I tried to, people wouldn't be ordering from me. And maybe some people do, but as far as I can tell, nobody, nobody does. Um, it's sort of a trust system, um, right now. And I think that is one of the areas where this industry can get more professional. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's why a lot of people see a benefit in using a distributor because you as an artist don't necessarily need to deal with that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I have had, sh- I generally from every show, I have a couple shops back out. But what I do is I, I don't take a deposit. I put them on my order list. I, I let them know up front how long it's, or at least an estimation how long it's going to be. I mean, right now I'm probably five to six months before people are going to get their work from the January show. Um, and if they're not okay with that, I I can see usually their reaction, whether or not they're okay with that. And I just tell them, Hey, like, feel free to hold off on the order right now. You know, let me know when you do want it and you can check back. But the reality of it is if you're in the business of buying and selling glass as a retailer, you need it year round. And so it's a good idea to have people tell you that this is going to be five months because you don't want everything coming in after age and then it all sells. And then, you're, you got this middle area of no glass, maybe. So yeah. at least I don't, I, I've never owned a retail store, so maybe I shouldn't speak for them, but that's, what, that's my interpretation of it. Um, so basically what I do is I put them on the list. I, am, I go by you know, order of when, when they showed up at the show and got their order in with me. Um, and then I call them about a week before I start the order to give them a heads up so that they can make sure they get money together. And a lot of times they'll tell me at that point, hey, I don't do this now. Or they'll say, absolutely, send it on over, and then I'll, I'll get the order done, and then I'll call them again for payment um, you know, the day I'm, I'm ready to ship it to them. And I'd say out of all the orders I've gotten over the past three years from those shows, I've maybe had four stores completely back out. But it is pretty rare, and it's it's nice to see because this t- is totally based on a trust system. And one thing I would say to the retailers is as an artist is this is my, this is my life. And this is all of our lives that go to this, these shows. And we go there and we spend a lot of money, especially on the Vegas show. We spend a lot of money to be there and to get, to get an iffy number um, as far as what your income is going to look like for that year. If you're basing it on those shows, is really scary. And so I'd, I'd say to store owners, if they're, they're placing an order that needs to be written in blood in my opinion you know that needs to be set in stone or as far as in your mind goes yeah i think that you know like you're saying like in terms of the professional side because again we're going through growing pains and there's so many shops out there now that either a benefited from the spice time where they were made a lot of money from the spice which then helped them to buy more higher in glass and get out of the china shit Mm -hmm. um so there's companies and stores that have a shit ton of money and then there's the mom and pops that are living kind of still bootstrapping their stores so they can't afford to go around to every artist and give a deposit. But I do agree that there needs to be something set in stone, maybe like a contract that's going to say, you, this is what you're agreeing to order. This is the estimated time of delivery. I will do a follow-up call to fine-tune everything in the, in the process. Maybe we need to make adjustments, maybe add or you know subtract. But there definitely needs to be a professional side of it because myself personally... I would request a deposit or something from everybody because, again, like you're saying, I mean, this is our lifeblood, and and if you you know you go to a shop, uh, these 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 things that cost you five grand minimum just mm-hmm. to go to a trade show between the cost of getting into it, all your setups, the cost, your flights, your shipping, your room. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, if you don't mind, it's, you know, discussing this, like, what is it? What did it, you think estimated was costing you? Say say from your first show to now, you've done what you said the past two years, you've done shows. 
Uh, yeah, well, I guess it's been three years. Three now. years now. So, but it... I've done two two American Glass Expos in January and two of the Denver ones, and I've done three Glass Roots. So, yeah, and the Glass Roots are closer for you, like, which makes it which is, is yeah. Which that's why I, lo- I love <clears> it. <throat> and it's sort of based on just being in the Midwest and being in Madison, which is such a cool town. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of one of those small towns that got flooded by college students and it's, so it's got this really cool artsy good food um but also it's like the Menona Terrace where we have the show is right on this lake and it's just huge and beautiful and there's a bike path that goes all the way around it and stuff and yeah so I love that show so yeah that's a cheap show for me in the sense that um I think the booth fee is actually maybe more than the American Glass Expo but since I can drive there um and carry all my materials with me um, and then I usually share a room with my friend Dan up in Duluth. Um, you know, the, the costs are much lower. Whereas Vegas, my wife comes with me to all these shows. Um, so I buy her plane ticket, obviously. And so we do that and we rent a car partially because we drive to Palm Springs, um, to visit with her folks while we're, while we're out there to make a little vacation on top of it. Um, but yeah, it is a very expensive show if you got to ship stuff. Um, Vegas is really expensive in the sense that it's really cheap to stay there and uh, for the most part eat there and gamble but everything else is really expensive Um, like shipping your supplies like the hard rock was charging just insane fees to even touch a box Um, and you could tell they were pretty frustrated by all that so yeah I would say the investment on like the Vegas show was you know around five thousand dollars if you want to look at all the costs, yeah. maybe a little, maybe a little less than that. Yeah. That's kind of the high number I was estimating. Like I went, I did a little a show on it and just did like flights from Tampa. Cause I mean, I'm kind of like the, one of the furthest places from Vegas in a sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, so like, you know, flights and hotel fees and shipping. I mean, cause I know like my brother went and he's done champs and age, uh, last year, I guess it was. And it cost him almost $300 just to ship his glass out there. You know, oh yeah. Is, and that's just regular boxes. I yeah. surprised probably spend four hundred dollars just on regular boxes whereas a lot of these people are sending crates Mm -hmm. Um, you know if if they have any display stuff they'll they'll ship a full crate and i can't imagine what that costs plus the handling fees because it's all that's the thing about the hard rock is that they're a corporate company um and so they have all these regulations and rules that they have to abide by and that that goes along with uh the illicit uh (laughs) activities that are happening as well it's, mm-hmm. it's not necessarily that they're trying to harsh on the uh the show's vibe and the the group that's there they're just trying to follow a the strict laws in vegas but b the strict laws of their corporate entity right um, and unfortunately our industry and not necessarily the glass blowers or even the store owners but maybe just attendees or um a lot of people don't necessarily respect that and that's it's unfortunate to see but there's only so much you can do with a, a large group of people of somewhat like mine, but everybody's got a different idea of what they're there for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was my concern with the uh, big show we had here, Big Galleria down in uh, Miami this last year, just because, you know, Florida still isn't a, le- a legal medical state. And the fact that we have a trade show that are promoting the pipe industry, and then if you got some jackass outside doing dabs out in front of the community, you know, the rec center or whatever <laughs> it is, and then all of a sudden, technically everything inside could be deemed illegal you know it's like you got sure. you know 400 artists with thousands and thousands of pipes that are now all right we got this huge you know everybody's getting life sentences bullshit <laughs> you know yeah. I, mean, I think of the worst when it is as it is but you know that's the th- kind of things that concern me you know and, and i get you know i get it but at the same time you know it's it's, it's kind of crazy you know because yeah. I'm, I'm sure like with this, again with like the porn industry that had the rewards there I'm sure they weren't having orgies in the fucking rec centers and, and, and you know, and they're in, as they're doing their shows, <laughs> but right. you got people walking around, you know, with their G pens and stuff, you know, having a good time. So it's, yeah, it's interesting stuff. So to, on the, on the numbers side, I mean, if you don't mind discussing, I don't even necessarily need a number, but like, did you find that your percentages of sales that you got out of the show were beneficial for what your initial expense, like your return on investment in a sense, like, was there a good return for you to make it worth it? Yeah, you know, I think everybody's got different expectations of what they need from a show or, or you know, need from their income as far as their art goes. And I w- I'd say that I'm fortunate in the sense that, you know, I'm married and my wife's got a great job and we have a dual income. And um, she, so as, 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 what I'm trying to say is not, not everything rides on the, the sales of my pipes. It's a big part of it. It's half of our income. But 
um, I can go to these shows and not expect to, to make, you know, to, for my cost to only be maybe 5% or whatever. I'm sure there's some, some marketing guru or that could tell you what percentage uh, your cost should be on a show like that compared to what you see out of it. Um, but no, for me, those shows by far pay all the costs. But then also, like I said, I'm from that show. I probably have five months worth of orders. Um, from that show, so I this year I'm only doing two shows, um, along with a couple other smaller events, um, but only two trade shows to to make for my entire year of orders. So in that sense, yeah, it's absolutely beneficial, um, and that's been the case from the first show I've done. I've never had a show where it's it's oh man, I barely made any money on that. Oh, I guess I should say the Denver Aid shows were not great. <laughs> yeah, I heard but the same were, thing. They were still worth it. I mean, Denver is a great place to be. All the costs were paid for based on my sales, and I had some orders. So, um, to me, then that that's a good show because that's the thing as a glass blower, you're going to be you're going to be doing a lot of these shows. Not every one is going to be, you know, huge for you. But yeah, yeah, I think I, I, that and that's the thought that I've had now because again, I'm in the same boat as you, bro. Like I, my wife makes a great income. You know, she's been supportive of me over the past year and a half as I've gotten this podcast up and you know, all my things going. Um, so, it, which is, it's huge, but you know, the dream of being able to do a trade show where every six months you go do a trade show and then you get six months with the orders, you know, it's, 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 it would be really sweet. And then the other side, like you're saying, or it's either you do that or you have a distributor that goes and reps the glass for you and you just keep them full. But yeah. you know, with distributors, you're not actually your face isn't necessarily out there. You have a company representing you. To where the trade shows, you're actually getting out there front and center and promoting yourself as an artist. But also, this is what I made, kind of thing, which I think is a little better if if you want to do that. You know, it's I right. think it's definitely beneficial. And but then like talking to other artists who have done it, who who appreciate getting those six months worth of orders about three months in when it's time for them to start making a certain order. They're like, oh man, I'm not fucking in the mood to do this or I don't want to do this anymore or whatever. You know, you kind of, <laughs> you miss out on that whole spark that you had from the minute you got the order. You know, it's kind of weird, you know, as, as this kind of yin and yang we got to deal with, with being an artist and a businessman at the same time, you know, knowing we have to produce this shit that this isn't just, okay, right now this is my heart and soul going to this piece this is okay i'm doing some production some even if it's higher in production to fill this order yeah you know it's kind of it's kind of it's, it's a weird back and forth kind of soul and brain kind of conflict that we have on a constant basis yeah so. and what what i'll say about that too is especially as a new glass blower that's doing these shows you got to be careful because um i mean doing this for a year and a half full time my progression has you know, seen night and day from from when I started or even from when I went full time. And so you take orders on um, like six months worth of orders on these pieces that you thought were going to be something you're doing for a long time. And also some the money that you're charging for them you think is going to sort of stay the same. And then all of a sudden your skills in the next six months drastically change um, and they're getting better. They're getting, you're using maybe more glass, better colors, different techniques in them. And that's Part of the thing that I like to do is I don't, it's really easy to get, even if like I, what I'd say is I, I, I've never really done production. That's more high end production, I guess. Everything can become production if you do it over and over. But um, the thing is, I always want to try new techniques and try different things. And so sometimes I'll incorporate those little things into the pieces that people ordered. And usually it's a positive thing. But a lot of times I'm maybe not charging for that new skill that I learned or color that I incorporated or, you know, whatever. So yeah, yeah. it is, it does get a little tricky if you're taking, you know, big, big orders and uh, a lot of time of orders. Cause then you get stuck in sort of this rut of not necessarily learning new things, um, as easily or as quickly. I don't know. Yeah, no, I totally, I totally understand that, man. Cause like I know myself with customs when I've done customs in the past where like it was something I had never done before. And a lot of times I like doing custom orders for people. Cause again, it's something I've never done and I'm learning a new skill. But when you price it out, in the end, it ends up being like, like recently I had an order where I did this water pipe for this girl and, you know, it's, it ended up being a nightmare. Like it actually made me stop doing customs for about three months just because <laughs> of it. But, you know, I gave, I quoted her a price on it and she was young and didn't understand, you know, what it takes to, to make this stuff. 
I mean, it got to a point where I was like arguing with like, I've been doing this longer than almost than you've been alive. So you have to understand <laughs> that you have to trust me what I'm saying, you know. I mean, I really, I gave, I mean, just to throw some numbers out there, I gave her a piece, 500 bucks, I charged her for it. I could have sure. easily wholesaled it for $1,000. <clears throat> when it was all said and done, you know, and, and, and after the fact that it was all said and done, I look at it, and I'm like, you know, it made me aware that even though I've been doing this for 17 years, I'm still myself going through these struggles or, you know, falling over myself and learning, you know, in the process of, of getting excited about what I'm doing for a living that I love the glass, you know, it's, it's almost like I would do this every day for free you know, in a sense, you know, so it's, it's, but you got to get paid for what your value of your glass is, you know, but then like you're saying, you get orders and you can't really do that. Do you think that maybe at, at a point where say you're learning a new technique that you're incorporating into an order that you've already been given that you would like preemptively let the shop know like, Hey, this is what this price is now. But then like next time you order it, it's going to be a little bit more because you know, the time or whatever that goes into it. Yeah. I guess there's maybe been some times that I've had those discussions. And I think being open and honest with store owners is the best thing you can do. Um, just because if your prices do change and they, they come back to a show or they come back for a second order or something and they say, wait, these prices are different, then hopefully you can explain like, yeah, but the, these are the different techniques now that are in it or they're this much bigger or use this much more glass or whatever. They have Illuminati or something in them, which mm -hmm. costs an arm and a leg or, um, so yeah, I think just being honest with people, but I think really you got to be careful with that. It's a fine line. And I think that's why a lot of people won't maybe release a product until they're, they A, perfected it or B, are ready to take orders on it. Um, and sometimes maybe I'm not the best at that because I get excited when I learn something new or created this new idea and I just put it out there in the world. Um, but yeah, I think you still got to stick with your prices, though. If, if a store is expecting something from a show, you, you got to give them what they expect for expect, and that's just good business. You can you can give them more than they expect, and if that includes that new technique or whatever, and mm -hmm. they they get that piece and they're like, "Oh man, he's like doing this in it. I wasn't expecting that, and I didn't, he didn't charge me more for it." Then I would much rather do that and have them sell it faster and come back to me you know, for another order and then tell them like, Hey, obviously you saw that was nicer or whatever is, or different. Um, so they are this price now. And generally they're, they're more than happy to pay that extra little bit for, for something new and better, you know? Yeah. It's that whole under promise and over deliver concept. Exactly. You know, it's, it's yeah. definitely important. You know, I, I, I always like throwing something extra in my, in my orders for shops or for, you know, a custom order or something like that. They just, you know, they weren't expecting it. And, it's always fun getting feedback. You know, the ones that don't give me feedback, I get a little, little irritated with. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's like, come on, man, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's definitely important, and and customer service, and especially dealing with the retail shops, it's it's important. You know, a lot of people don't like the custom stuff because having to deal with the customer straight on is it can be a pain in the ass. Um, like for example, we had over at Disney, one of our soft glass guys, uh, he's been doing soft glass for twenty years in the furnace. And one of our guests asked for a specific piece and the price tag was wrong on it. And he's like, well, I'll give you, you know, the price on that, whatever it's listed at. It was like 30 bucks less than what it was supposed to be. And they asked him to make it another one for him with, their, with specific dimensions. And he made the specific dimensions. And then when they saw it, they're like, oh, can you do it a little bit bigger? <laughs> you know, and he's like, what the fuck? I just gave you guys a discount and you're wanting to like spit my face Change now, it. you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. And he's like, well, I made it again because I knew I, the first one's going to sell anyways. And a lot of times that happens that way, but still it's like, it's such a kick in the balls sometimes, you know, but at the same time for the shop owners too, it's the same way. They order something and they didn't get what they expected. It's a kick in the balls for them and it just puts a bad taste in their mouth and then they will probably never order again. And, and it's good that yourself, like you're telling these shops that, hey, this is going to take five months. That's a long fucking time to get to be sitting after ordering something and the fact that you follow up and you say, Hey, I'm getting started on your order just to make sure we're on the same page because yep. they're so busy doing their thing. They don't always keep track of all their people they talk to and shit, you know? So, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it, it amazes me every show that I, I, what I print out order forms that are specific for that show. I, every time somebody's ordering, I offer to give them a copy. Um, you know, my wife will sit there and write a copy of the order form and I'll write one. It's one for my records and one for theirs. And 95% of these store owners, they won't take pictures. They won't take an order form. And it's 
you'll call them and they'll you'll tell them, hey, hey, this is Adam with Crux Glass. Uh, you know, I'm just I'm gonna start your order. And like, wait, who are you? What did I order again? Can you send me some pictures? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, well, I understand why you don't remember that. You didn't take anything in the chaos of the show, you know? Yeah, maybe like do something where you have like photos of all your work, you know, and on a, on a sheet of paper, you can have like a little check checkbox next to it. Like, okay, you want this and the pricing and shit on there. Yeah, you know, it's just tough. I end up, you know, for me, getting ready for a show is crazy. I try to leave a month, but it generally comes down to two weeks. Yeah. I'm, I'm working crazy to get ready for a show to have 30 or 40 pieces on my table. Um, and that, that includes staying up till crazy hours of the night, the, the night we fly or the night before we fly out, printing out my order forms and then taking the last few things that are still warm out of the kiln and putting them in my carry on. So it's kind of hard to prepare your order forms properly and take pictures and all that stuff. And that's why it ends up being slightly chaotic, but yeah, it makes it, sense. It all it all works out as long as you try to stay organized at the show. Well, you sound a lot more organized than a lot of people I talk to, <laughs> so, <laughs> which again was why we wanted I wanted to bring you on as we had previously discussed. You know, you've, being having done this for five years now, you've, you've you are some you know somewhat successful as as a you know five year glass artist and doing what you're doing. But you seem also to have business background and some some good head on your shoulders. So it's important, and I'm glad you're sharing the story with us. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, not a problem, man. So to kind of move forward with from the trade shows, and you're, you're married. Do you have any kids at all yet, or you just got just, just the wife? Uh, just the wife, and I don't know that I'm allowed to say this necessarily, but we did just find out that we got one on the way. Ooh, hell yeah, man. <laughs> Fucking A. Yeah. World exclusive premiere right there. How about that? Yeah, yeah for that's, sure. That's awesome, man. Congrats. Thank you so much. Yeah, we actually have our second doctor's appointment tomorrow morning. Um yeah, everything's great. Everything seems to be happy and healthy, and we're super excited. We've been married for two and a half years, and yeah, we're super excited. But it does mean that I'm going to lose my uh, partner for a lot of the trade shows, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, you'll find another, another, if I guess, buddy to go along with you, help out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm sure at that point, too, you'll, you're going to get to a point where you're going to probably want to bring like an assistant on of some sort to to do all your errand running and stuff like that. So you don't have to worry about leaving too much. Yeah, man. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Oh dude, it's huge. Yeah. It's, <laughs> once I brought my assistant on, it made a big difference. It's nice to be like, Hey Mike, can you go run to the post office? Yeah, man, no problem. What do you need? And it's like, it's, it's a big That's deal. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. It makes a big difference. Yeah, and I, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a whole show on that talking about bringing on an assistant and the process to go through it to where it makes it beneficial for yourself and for them. Cause like when I put my thing out for an assistant, I threw it up on Instagram, like, hey, I'm looking for somebody. I was overwhelmed by emails. Like, I couldn't believe people were wanting to drive five hours just to come be my assistant. You know, it was, it was humbling and pretty cool. Mm-hmm. But I was very specific with what I was looking for, you know, and, and I sent the email out to those interested. Like, hey, this is what I'm looking for. You're not getting paid for the first 90 days, all that kind of shit, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, I fine-tuned it down to, like, three people, which then I chose Mike out of the whole group. You know, it's, it's kind of fun, so I'm going to definitely talk about that. But, um yeah, man. So, how old are you? Yeah, that's got to be challenging. Oh, 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 sorry. oh I'm, uh, I'm 29. I'll be 30 in September. Okay, cool. So, yeah, but yeah, we were saying about the challenge. Oh, yeah, I was going to say that would be really challenging because being a craftsman and owning your own business um, is so personal. And I just can't even imagine going through that process of, of giving up some of that responsibility to somebody of even shipping, you know, or the small things like returning emails. There's man, it's so personal and it's so, it's sort of like, this is my baby and this is, especially when you're going to ship out glass or, you know, do those different things. It'd be, it'd be tough to put it in somebody's hands, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. There's a, a show I listen to uh, called The Art of Charm and uh, I recommend it to anybody. It's, it's, it's dedicated really towards men, but it's got a lot of beneficial information for everybody. But they had a guest on and they were talking about that exact thing about like how our businesses are like our heart and soul and, you know, what we put into it. And to your first employee is always the most difficult. Eventually, you may have 500 employees, but that very first employee, it's like it's so hard to do. And they were saying like there's and I don't remember the exact percentages, but there's a, a, a formula they have where they show where if you teach somebody specifically a certain way that you do things and you spend so much time with them the long-term payoff is huge in amount of time that you save. You know, just to sit down with somebody over a week period of time and say, this is how I pack my stuff, specifically how I wrap all my orders up, make sure I'm signing it first. The whole, I mean, you have a specific 
regimen of how you do it and you teach them that and if right. they if they deviate from that at all you got to like reel them back in and say hey you got to do it exactly like this and then once they get it down you can then walk away and then that you know you can trust that that is going to get done that certain way right. but you have to invest initially up front the hours and time that goes into it but in the long run you know you spend 30 hours teaching somebody how to specifically do that you're going to save yourself thousands of hours down the road you know, it sucks packing orders, man. Like, I'd love it, but I'm, that's probably the one thing where I fault at in my business the most is packing orders and getting them sent out on time. Oh, man. <clears throat> you know. All mine definitely go out on time, but it is, it's one of the, I sort of have anxiety of making people wait um, in all aspects of my life. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm in the same boat. Um, yeah, but it is, it is my least favorite. Th- Actually, I'll say signing my work with a tie pen is my least favorite <laughs> activity in this industry. I don't know why. It's just like this thing that when I sit down and I look at a batch of glass and I'm like, I got to sign all this stuff. If I were better, I should just sign every one as it comes out of the kiln or whatever. But You're right. Oh, it is like my least favorite thing. I don't know why. <laughs> That's funny. My buddy Chad, my shop mate, he, has, uh, he went over to Harbor Freight and got like, uh, leather tools with like letters and numbers and shit it's like a whole kit you can get and he's taken like for this year he's got his cp for his chad piece thing that he does and then he's got 16 on there and he's just like put the two cps together and then the 16 and he stamps everything that he makes whether really? it's a hand pipe or a, you know whatever and everything has this impression in the bottom of it while it's still hot yeah. and uh yeah dude everything he makes has it in there and i was like damn that is a great idea yeah because i'm the same way like signing like my wrists are sore sometimes and signing a with the tie pins, the angle you got to get at and everything. It's sometimes yeah. like it hurts my wrist to do it. Yep. Not to mention like the f- sensation of scratching the glass and the sound it makes. It's like nails <laughs> on a chalkboard sometimes. To be, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But at the same time, it's cool, man. When people are like, Hey, you want to sign this for me? I'm like, fuck yeah, I'll sign that for you. You know? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think that's important to have. It's, it's an archive, you know, having a date and a, you know, we don't know where this industry is going to go and you don't know where you're going to go as an artist yourself. So mm-hmm. those so it's important to have those pieces yeah. claimed, you know, and having your name on them. Yeah, I agree. Hell yeah. So, so with the uh, being married, have you found like a, a routine or a schedule or like a the work life balance kind of routine that you go through with yourself, or is it kind of up in the air? Uh, uh yeah, we just work. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no, um, I pretty much work six days a week. I, I try to make sure that I take off Mondays with, with my wife because where she works is closed on Mondays. And uh, she works for herself too. So we both get to make our own schedules, which is a huge, yeah. huge deal. Um, that's why she can come to the shows and we get to go on a lot of trips. We're actually leaving for Thailand on Wednesday. Yeah, I want to talk about that in a bit. Yeah, so we get to we get to travel a lot together. And obviously things are going to change with the baby, but we, we uh, definitely still plan on being adventurous parents and taking our kid out and um doing those things but yeah we you know it's it's tough we're definitely good being having our alone time um so she she i work early i'm i like to work really early in the morning um and she doesn't go to work until usually around noon so i get that morning time in the shop by myself she gets that morning to do her thing she likes to take the dog out and go on long walks with them and stuff. And then, then I have a little bit of time to sort of settle down after I get done working around six. Um, and she doesn't get home till about eight. So I'll maybe get some things prepared for dinner or, you know, and then we just always try to take Mondays off together, which we love. We love having a weekday off together because we don't like to be around crowds of people. So Mm -hmm. if we need to go run errands or anything, we kind of got the places to ourselves, which is nice. Yeah, man, I love having I'd like Wednesdays like like my new day off. And oh yeah, I love it, dude. Yeah, like the, the weekdays off, like because I'm always laughing at myself. I'm like, you know, all these motherfuckers are working, are working and I am off today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even if you work for yourself, you got to take a day off. You know, you just got to set one oh. day to, to to get shit done. Yeah, and I'll say as a glass blower, you're never really taking a full day off. No, I'll, I know. I'll still answer a bunch of messages or pack glass up and get it to the post office on Mondays or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. But yeah, that's good shit. So, do you, where's your studio at? You work out of your house, or do you have a location? I do uh, work out of my house. We bought a house uh, just before we got married, a month before we got married, actually. Um, and I turned the garage into a. It's all my shop. There's, it's not a garage at all, really. It's like a one and a half car garage, and the whole thing is my my shop. So hell yeah. Yeah, yeah I, well. I tried talking my wife into letting me do that again because I was in here myself in the garage and then got my studio space. 
<clears throat> which I like going to work, like having a place away from home because I'm not distracted by chores or the yard mm. or wanting to play out in the garden and shit. But yeah, I, I definitely miss walking out my back door here and being in the garage. Yeah, I can definitely see the benefit of going somewhere. Um, my friend's glass studio is just like a block and a half north of me, uh, Chris A. Halt. And we've been working together a little bit late, lately on some collabs. And it's just this really awesome space that's obviously not at his house. And this, it's in sort of artist building. Um, and so it's been really nice going over there once in a while. And I can definitely see the benefits of getting away from home. But being a new glass blower and a new business person, having not thinking about that extra cost is also really helpful. Yeah, I think about it every time I write my check. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like fuck, like we just downsized from twelve hundred square foot to six hundred square feet, which has been great for my mind space and also my checkbook too. But yeah, yeah, I think about that extra money I'm spending on rent. I'm like, damn, I could just buy more glass or a kiln or yeah. you know keep upgrading my shit. Yeah, you know. Especially when I'm not in there as much as I was. I'm now, you know, doing the Disney thing full time till May. So I'm in the studio like maybe two days a week right now doing doing my, my work. Oh really? Yeah, so it definitely uh but whatever. It is what it is. Yeah. I don't mind it. So yeah, dude, so what kind of activities do you do outside of glass blowing? Oh man, we try to do a lot. Um my big thing the past couple of years since I do work so much, I used to we used to be a pretty big rock climbers. Um, used to travel around and climb and go to the gym a lot. Um, and that's kind of taken a backseat because we've been working so much. Um, and so I've really gotten into running. Um, it's one of my big activities. I like to do my first marathon last year and I like wow. to do races. So I do half marathons and 25 Ks and stuff. And Jesus, dude. Yeah, so that's one of my big big thing that takes a lot of my life up um as far as time goes mountain biking is really big for me too we have great that was the store i helped open was a really great enthusiast bike shop um so that really got me into mountain biking and we have really great trails around minneapolis um but yeah other than that playing with our dog a lot going on hikes and canoeing and minnesota is great for a lot of outdoor activities we don't have mountains or anything but tons of tons of nature yeah that's what i hear i want to come visit one of these days i need to get up to to the shows come do glass roots yeah man glass roots is awesome yeah and then you can make your way back over to minneapolis and check it out yeah you ever get yourself involved in any of the uh michigan projects at all or any of those kind of things uh yeah actually i'm going this year i just signed up to do a little demo spot at the michigan glass project i've been wanting to go because i'm from there and I was actually born in Detroit. My dad still lives near Detroit, and so does my brother. Um, so it's got a little place in my heart, so I've been wanting to get there. But um, So, yeah, this year I'm not doing a middle trade show, and I'm doing that. And then we have another demo day for me in the works at a shop in Illinois near Chicago. Um, I believe it's called All About It. Um, I'm going to do a demo day there, possibly in conjunction with that same time of the uh, Michigan project. Um, yeah, so I got those two things in the works right now, but I haven't done like the DFO or anything like that yet. It's just a lot of, a lot of travel. Yeah. I like to, I like to stay close to home for the most part and keep working, but yeah, I heard a guy one day that was a big business guy. He says like, you know, he's always traveling. He's so busy. He's like my favorite, my favorite time to travel and places to visit is the inside of my house. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah, it makes so much sense because we're never home. Yeah, you know it's killer. So uh, when you do your when you're doing these demos, like have you, have you do you have like a routine or I mean I know this is new for you yourself, but have you figured out like a like a like how you charge your time or any of that kind of stuff? How you set it up with the shops? Um, as far as just doing like a demo, like the glass project, the Michigan glass. No, project? like the sh like the shop you're gonna be going to, for instance, you know, because a lot oh, of shops, sure. like you know, the trends are for shops to to if they don't have a studio inside, at least to have a tent out front, you know, and have demos and stuff. Oh, sure, yeah, they got. I guess they have a pretty big working space with a bunch of torch stations and stuff. So, um, I don't think I'll have to worry about any of that there. Um, and we haven't talked too much about the details, but other than that, they just said I think they're gonna hook me up with a hotel room and. I'll probably bring some work to try to sell. I don't know if that's cool with them or if they'll buy some. I know they want to put an order in too, so maybe they'll just buy some work from me. And I know a lot of people will kind of make these deals where they just, whatever they make there, they they purchase. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that usually works out pretty good. I don't necessarily expect anything like that other than just getting some exposure. That'll be my first real time blowing glass in front of people. Um, like I said, I haven't, you know, hardly even taken a, a lesson other than, you know, learning how to make a pendant, right. you know, five, five years ago. Um, I did take a, a Venetian class with Chris A. Halt that I was talking about. Um, he was trained by Cesare Toplo and I got to take a two day course with him. Uh, but we basically just worked on learning how to use jacks and making cups and feet and stuff. And so I haven't really taken any pipe technique classes at all. Do you find that those classes helped you with your pipes? Um, you know, it did in the sense, it might've been a little early for me to take that class. And also if you want to do that kind of vessel work, you got to practice it all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not something I came back and practiced right away or ever necessarily, but I did, there was some certain things about the way a Venetian trained person works that you can really put into pipe work, especially if you're doing larger vessel work with your pipe work, you know, things just like watching your heat base and rotating slowly. Um, and just using different types of flames, um, which can be challenging because as pipe artists, we use a lot of crazy colors and you got to use a lot more oxygen maybe than, than a Venetian vessel worker would need to use. Um, so that can become a challenge. But yeah, I think really just what I took away from that class was really paying attention to your heat base um, and eating th heating things very evenly before you start to make any type of moves um, as far as blowing or stretching or anything like that. Yeah. But yeah, as far as the actual class, it was an awesome experience. It was one of the first times I actually got to watch somebody blow glass for a while. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, so that was cool, but... Yeah, I think it's important to, and I preach it all the time, to take a, a furnace work class or some kind of class of that sort that's different than pipe making. Because, you're, again, you're, like you're saying, you're going to see somebody else doing something completely different that maybe you've never seen before. You may mm -hmm. learn some new hand tricks. You know, like myself, having done this for so long, when, I, when I've taken classes recently, which was some of the first classes I ever took myself, I was really big into, like, looking at how their torch was set up, how their tools were set up on their bench, like how their hands moved, you know, certain kind of what they're, you know, and, and I like, I like the term making a move. I had never really heard that before until I took a uh, Joe Peters, Peter Muller class. They did a class together recently last year. And, uh, you know, they had talked about that, like, you know, what's the next move going to be? And you got to like kind of plan it out like a chess match in a sense. And, you know, it's so important to kind of have that predetermination of what you're going to be doing. So you're prepared for it. And then you're also prepared for it. If something fucks up in the process, you know, and how to, how to fix that to get then to your next move. Yeah, That's a lot you can take away from it, you know, especially like if you take a furnace class and you get into working with with the furnace and getting a gather and, you know, the different types of glass that they use. It's so different than Boro. It's amazing how much different that glass is. And, and for me, I was actually kind of as crazy as it sounds. It was kind of boring for me doing furnace work only because of having to sit at the bench and waiting for my glass to cool off enough to where I can go back in and get a gather. Oh, yeah. You know, that downtime, I was like, God, this is fucking boring. I'm so used to just getting hot and why can't I do this and why can't I do that? And they're like, because this does not work like your shit does, you know. Get over yeah. yourself. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's kind of with funny. The torch, with the torch, I think there's a tendency to, um, yeah, like you were saying, not necessarily plan out your moves. So there's a tendency to stay in the flame. And when you don't really know what you're, the reason you're in the flame is, um, well, and that's kind of one of those things that that class taught me. It was just like wait till you know have the torch in a, in the flame for a very specific amount of time that heat's really important and then when you come out that heat's really important um you know maybe letting it maybe letting it cool enough so that it creates that sort of skin layer on it before you do your puff or your stretch um which will sort of even your heat base out a little bit and let things get saturated um and until you see somebody do those things you don't really have a concept of that at, at all you just you heat it up and then you blow into it and then you uh, hope it turns out to be a round shape you know or yeah whatever. yeah absolutely well you know that's why i think pulling points as as much as people hate doing it and it's i'm gonna again i keep saying this but i'm gonna do a show on, on the reasons behind pulling points because like i've i mean i've pulled hundreds of thousands of these fucking things over the years and it still to this day it's i find it still it's so important to learn you learn your heat base, you learn how to work your torch, you learn how to make your glass hot, how to make it evenly heated, how to pull it out and wait a second. You don't want to just stretch it right away, let the glass settle. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many little small details involved in that instead of just popping a hole and throwing a blowpipe on there. You know, it's like yeah. almost anybody can do that, but I've mm -hmm. got guys that I've worked with that have never pulled a point before. 
It's crazy. Yeah, that's I, I fall into that category to a certain extent. You know, I did a lot of point pulling, you know, in that class and a little bit after. And but yeah, as far as for most of my work, it's just attaching that blow tube. I mean, mm-hmm. partially because it's 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 fast and easy, and also partially because. I'm working with a lot of big glass a lot of times. I, you know, I pull all my own line work and stuff, so I'm often using really big glass and 75 mil tubing and 50 mil tubing and things like that. So um, obviously you're not going to be using points for that kind of yeah, thing. But yeah. definitely a little technique stuff. I could absolutely be using points instead of blow tubes, you know, whether it's wig wags or, you know, prepping color balls or, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's a generational thing too. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I'm getting that weird feedback again. Oh, really? Yeah, it's weird. I wonder if it's a timing thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I wonder if it's coming up in the recording myself. Like, if, I don't. I'm I'm trying to ignore it, but I'm like, I wonder if it's coming up in the recording. And if that is the case, then that's going to be annoying. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not hearing anything, but okay. It could just be my on my end. No, but sure. I, I think I actually just went away. Oh, good. Yeah, weird. But yeah, man. You know, I think it's also a generational thing too, because like my generation, we. Not, I shouldn't say have to, but we did in a sense had to do production to make a living mm-hmm. to also compete with the China market and everything else going on. So it's, you know, I think it's also, again, it's a, it's a generational thingy, um, yeah. you know, just in mindset and stuff. But I still think it's an important thing to learn only because, again, it's just that the, the, the little nuances that you get out of it are, are what are going to give you that foundation for down the road. You know, that, that one thing leads to another, leads to another kind of kind of concept. Yeah. And, you know, I think with any craft, there's, um, and this is kind of one of, one of the things I wanted to mention and talk about is being a new glass blower. I, I see a lot of new glass blowers and I see, I've, I've been in sort of this weird spot of five years ago. Like a lot has changed even in this five years mm-hmm. um, from when I started, whether it's like the size of pieces or the different techniques or the different function of things. Like I've, you really got to adapt quickly. Um, but what I see a lot of times is there is a little bit of a, uh, a disconnect with the new generation as far as um, learning things the way that maybe that they were meant to be learned and sort of having respect for the process. Um, and like you're saying, like pulling points, if, if you have the opportunity to learn how to pull points or you have the, you know, knowing that points are there and they're, they have a reason, you should try to learn how to pull them or, you know, any technique that you knew that existed for a really long time in lamp working, it should be a part of your, DNA to maybe want to learn that as a as somebody who's wanting to learn this this skill and this craft, and you see these people that are, you know, social media is crazy for this stuff, and I try to not pay attention too much to it, but you see all these new glass blowers that are starting to do these complex seals and things right away um, before they even really understand understand the material in its very root form, and I would say after five years of doing it. I still don't, I'm just now becoming comfortable with the actual material and having an idea in my head and being able to somewhat make that happen out of the material that I'm working with. Um, And I see that even on a very physical level every day for the past five years, you know, not recently, but before that, working with glass sort of feels like a struggle. It sort of feels like it's going to kind of do what it wants to do and you're not necessarily controlling it 100% because it's the struggle that's happening all the time and it mm-hmm. feels like a feels like a wrestling match once you sort of cross that line and this is what I've seen lately and then my work has really progressed in the past even six months um, is that when I go out there every day and I work I, I feel comfortable with the material you know and I feel like okay I understand some things about it that, I, and I'm not going to claim that I understand everything about it, not even close, but um, there's just working with it and feeling it is comfortable now. And now I can actually start utilizing some of the techniques that I've been wanting to learn or maybe I've practiced in the past. I sort of see people sort of skipping that entire step of becoming comfortable with the material and they're immediately going into these complex seals um, and worrying so much about the function of this the pipe industry and you know these different things and also trying to do these techniques that they see out there that a lot of people have spent decades learning how to do Mm -hmm. jumping right into that and it's kind of scary to see you know it is the age of information a lot of people say we have it a lot more easy right now because of all the information out there and there's a ton of information 
but I also see it as a, as a huge downfall for a lot of people. Um, oh, I agree hundred percent. Yeah. And just not, not going through the steps and maybe not having the respect for the material or the artists that came before them. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, man. Cause I, I know like part of, part of our industry is art and part of our industry is business. And for those that are new that say we're introduced from degenerate art or something of that nature, I get fired up every time I see that documentary. You know, Slinger does such a good job on showing the history of our industry and then showing where it is now. And it's a lot of fucking fun, you know, to, yeah. to, I mean, I, dude, I mean, seriously, I saw, I watched towards the end of this video, that video and that show. I'm like, I get fired up. If it's three in the morning, I want to go blow some glass, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I get it, you know, but at the same time, it's like, when you look at the business side of things, there's a couple of podcasts I listen to. And this one guy, uh, John Lee Dumas, he's like, he's like one of the pre guy, like the main guys in the podcast industry right now. And I say that because he does coaching and whatever else, but this dude's making like seven figures a month through revenue from his podcast and he puts it up on his website every month. They have a monthly income report and he shows like his expenses and whatever, but he's been doing this for three and a half, almost four years now. And it's taken him seven. He does a pod. It's a seven day a week show. So he's like, you know, it's, it's seven days a week. That's a lot of fucking time putting into it. Wow, he's also yeah. done it for three and a half years, you know? So this guy's in a sense, he's gotten lucky that I hate using that term, but he's gotten lucky in the space, but he's also worked his ass off and had to like, start from the very beginning of not knowing what the fuck he was doing to where now he's teaching people how to make this kind of money. But the mm -hmm. podcasters out there that see his numbers, they think they can make that shit overnight. So right. they repeat and they copy his show and they make a show that's formatted just like his show and it doesn't fucking work. The glass mm -hmm. in, in our industry is the same way. You see these guys out there that are making thousands of dollars for their pipes that have been doing it for 10 plus years. And then you got these new guys come in that want to duplicate that exact same piece thinking they can sell their thing for thousands of dollars and they've been uh, behind the torch for a fucking week yeah. and it just doesn't work. And I understand, I understand it, but if you can just get on the torch and not think about how much I'm getting paid for this, how much money I'm going to make, it's, it's an interesting dichotomy in our industry because again, it is so fun to what we do and exciting and there's a shit ton of money and we've only, we're only at the tip of the iceberg right now. I mean, fuck, man. Yeah. Underneath the water is a trillion dollar industry that once federal legalization happens, who knows what's going to happen. I think that if you're going to start making a glass, you've got to start off the right way, which is to get a good foundation, to get good habits, to be safe, and not be a fucking cocky jackass. Yeah, you know, I keep going back to, well, I think it was Slinger that actually said this on Facebook was, uh, would you rather be overrated or underpaid yeah. and that really that really stuck with me because i was like you know you're right so since i started blowing glass i kind of came in this in this industry of like it was it was at the time five years ago it was all the glasspipes.org mm -hmm. which i just found out is possibly closing down oh dude my brother that day he's like hey man go on there and get all your pictures off i was one of the first 10 people on that thing and i haven't used it oh, really? yeah and i haven't used it probably in 10 years yeah it was kind of cool man not to like brag about myself but like when i first got you on there you had they had like a ranking system of like the top i think top 20 artists and yeah. it was like jason lee marcel braun scott deppy bear claw slinger and then i was in there i was like in the top five for like five <laughs> five nice. like first three years or so yeah it was awesome and then i stopped posting on there and it went to shit and then yeah. i went back on there the other day looking at that stuff i had made back then i was like oh my god i forgot i was doing that shit like Right. I was ahead of my time. <laughs> yeah, Not really, but awesome. it, you know, but it's cool, you know, seeing that. But yeah, anybody out there that is on glasspops.org, screen capture your pictures and save them, keep them. Yeah, you know, it's actually I just did that because so I went on there. Again, I hadn't been on there for a long time because everything's kind of moving away from there because of all the new so social media outlets, but mm -hmm. um that is where I saw glass for the first time. Like when I started blowing glass, I knew of Adam G and his amazing work at the time. And I knew of Yushin because Adam told me about Yushin, I think. And I, he's like, he sent me the link to glasspipes.org and I went on there and started looking. I was like, holy cow, it just opened this world to me. And like, that's why I wanted to start blowing glass because of what Adam showed me and like the pendants that he'd wear back in college. Um, and then seeing glasspipes and glassartist.org. And so when I started blowing glass five years ago, I sort of had this feeling of needing to catch up of like, I was, I wasn't young, you know, I was, well, whatever, 24, 25. So, I, was, I mean, I was young, but not, I wasn't super young to start a new thing, but I was like, had this sort of urgent feeling of, okay, I need to catch up. And I think that back to what we were talking about, as far as the new generation in the industry, 
there's, there's that feeling across the board, right? Because they're seeing all this stuff, this amazing work that's being made for and selling for a lot of money. And so they have this feeling of, I need to catch up. I need to be one of these people. And there's two routes that you can take to that. And that's the, the basically underpaid or overrated scenario of, would you rather catch up in hype and of like making these crazy seals like clients and stuff like that and maybe not making them clean? Or would you rather catch up by working super hard and just becoming that person in a very organic way? And that's really what I strive to do was do that, but, but also try to do that by not stepping on any, to- on any toes on the way. Because there's another thing that's really easy to do, and that's like to really annoy people. When you, and I, I think I rode that fine line for a little while, you know, by maybe asking Adam questions via text or, you know, different people that I had met in the industry, like, man, I have the sense of urgency, like I need to catch up in this stuff and I'm, I think I'm on the edge of learning this technique or, and then you, you'll text a question over to somebody or send them a message on Facebook or something and you, you know, after you do it, you're like, oh, why did I do that? I probably annoyed that person, you know? And so there's, this, there's all these different things that you can do when starting this new craft and it, it, it's, it's really tough to sort of navigate that and know the right thing to do. And all I can say is just work hard and just be be your own person and and figure it out for yourself and have a good support system. Mm-hmm. You know, my wife was awesome when I started this. She was just like super gung ho for it and super supportive. And um, oh yeah, so back to the glass pipes thing too. I just noticed I went on there yesterday because I heard about that and found out that my picture is like the number one featured gallery right now <laughs> nice fuck yeah dude how about that it's like the it's like the first one on there it's a collab between chris a halt and i when that guy i was talking about i've been working with that's funny i'm actually on there right now looking at stuff yeah so the first <clears throat> picture on the featured it was i think it was uh ben burton featured us on there it's like this chameleon bubbler that we made um like a year ago so oh yeah pretty, yeah i see it on I, mean, there. I don't know where all that story was going to but <laughs> yeah I guess all in all is if you get started, start off with a good, strong foundation and don't be a cocky fuck. Yeah. To put it in uh, yeah. generalized terms. <laughs> or do it too, you know, maybe that'll get you somewhere. Yeah, maybe, or get your ass kicked, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, tough, though, you know, you see some of these guys, it can get frustrating where it's like they, they start off with some natural skill, which I think is important. There's, mm-hmm. there's a certain degree of you got to catch on to certain things quickly. If you see, like I'm... I haven't seen many people blow glass and I haven't taken many lessons or anything, but if I see something done, it's, it's stuck in my head and I can sort of take that knowledge that even from just seeing it, maybe without even it being instructed to me, but just seeing something done. Um, and I can take that home and I can usually get some information from that. So I think there's a little bit of natural talent that needs to happen in the beginning there. Yeah. But then also you see some of these guys that happen to roll with the right crowd in the beginning, you know, and like, they have that going on, but then they also have like these four dudes that are, have been doing it for a long time and they wind up in their shop and they get to learn from some of the best guys. And that's, those are the guys you're envious of where it's like, Oh man, that's, that's like the perfect storm of awesomeness there. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, man. Speaking like with your work, like, you know, I've been following your work for a long time. I had no idea you've only been doing glass for five years. Like I wouldn't, you couldn't tell, you know, and I've always admired your stuff. So I was definitely, it was, when you contacted me about coming on the show, I was like, yeah, dude, let's do it because I've been a big fan for a while. Oh, man, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, hell yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think that being said, it, you know, I find that with the glass medium itself gives somebody the ability to express herself and that there's artists in our industry and in glass in general that can't draw a stick figure to save their life, but for whatever reason, they can represent whatever their thoughts and their soul is into glass and make something incredible out of it, no matter how much foundation of art they have or glass skill, they're still able to come up with something out of this medium. And it's, it's unlike any medium out there. I mean, even getting into clay and stuff like I've done clay sculptures and what have you most of my life before I got into glass even. And I was enjoyed the sculpture. And and once I got into the glass, but I guess for myself, like my timeline is I've taken art classes and have a a art background and always wanted to be a professional artist. So for me, it was just natural. I never expected to be a glass artist ever, you know, like I've always wanted to work for Disney my entire life. I never expected I'd be there blowing glass. Like it's just kind of oh, crazy. Really? You know what I mean? Yeah. But I think that you're like, you're saying like there are a select group of people in our industry that are brand new at this, that have amazing talent, 
And it just takes the right person to show them the right thing to be like, holy shit. And then that person is just blowing everybody's fucking minds. Right. You know, like Joe Peters, I, that dude lying glass, that's his apprentice or was his apprentice for a while. Um, I was seeing this guy's work coming out. I'm like, God, it looks like Joe P's work. And then I started doing some research and I talked to Joe himself about it. And, and he was kind of giving me some insights to him. And this kid's got a lot of fucking talent. And it's natural, raw talent. And it just, this dude just happened to find a medium that was he was able to get his voice out with. You know, so, yeah. and I get that. But again, as an artist, it's fun to be creative and expressive and want to just like make the sprint instead of the marathon. And you're a great example, dude, especially the fact that you run marathons. This is, <laughs> this is a marathon. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. this is not a fucking quick race unless you're in a competition and you've got three minutes to make something, you know, get her done. But in the meantime, it's, you got to take it step by step by step and really learn everything. And then eventually, you know, you're going to learn. I don't know. It's kind of crazy. Like the idea of being a master, you know, like I've mastered some techniques, but I'm nowhere near a master. And, and I've been doing this for 17 years. Mm -hmm. I may not ever be a master. Maybe in my next lifetime, I might get close to it, you know, but it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's just, I don't know. It's, I'm all over the place right now but <laughs> in my head oh. thinking about this shit, but it's like, you know, it's so funny just, just, just seeing it. But I think the worst again about this whole thing is that social media has kind of fucked it up for it's 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 a huge benefit, but it's also fucked it up for a lot of us and not us, you and me, but like those that are getting started because again they have this backing of people that are like, yeah, man, that's awesome, that's amazing. How much? You know, it's a thousand dollars and blah 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 blah. Yeah. You know, it's it's and it inflates what's there. Yeah, and it's tough. It's yeah, the the whole pricing thing is tough in general. But yeah, back to what you're saying about kind of the taking the small steps and not trying to run the marathon right away. That's Man, that's so important. Like two, I said in the beginning of this year in 2016 that I'm going to attempt to find my voice a little bit because in art, like it, you got to take those first steps of just learning the medium um, before you can ever create a character or your voice or whatever. And you were talking about the sculptural thing. I, ha I think having that clay sculptural thing is huge because that's not something I always drew as a kid and I could, I could draw and sketch and whatever, but, and I was an art minor in school, but um you know, with the sculpting thing, it's not something I know well. And so the, the idea of removing or, or adding glass or, you know, to, to create this figure is not something I'm um, knowledgeable about at all. And that's why I've really stuck to shapes and, you know, trying to make, use color work well, because I think I have an eye for that. But um, this year is kind of my going to be my attempt to uh, learn a little bit more of that sculptural side, learn a little bit more of finding my voice and what my image is. And I don't know if you've seen, but I started this storm cloud series. And that's just kind of like a, a variation of just basic shapes that I've been doing for a while, like a really tight twisted line work tube, which makes the cloud. Um, and then kind of playing off the same thing that everybody does with the drippy stuff. Um, but as opposed to doing like oil drip or honey drip or whatever, I'm just making them my storm cloud series. And I turned that into a tube. And so that's my, that's been my first, after five years, the first thing that I've said, like, this is, this is my thing. This is my, a little bit of my voice and my image. And I don't know if that I'm there yet with the idea and the concept, but that's the thing is I think a lot of people, they'll start to try and that's the marathon It's figuring out your, your voice in this industry and a lot of people are trying to find that voice right away and it just doesn't get translated well because they don't know the medium yet and they don't have an understanding of just how to work with the material but that's so that's what i've been trying to do is what i'm trying to say is just really get to know the material for the past five years and that really just means you know making hollow vessels making nice shapes you know doing straight marias and you know clean line work and all those things and nice lip wraps and, and in calmos and things like that more of the traditional stuff which is still my what i am attracted to um as far as what i like in glass you know i, I like glass that looks like glass i've never been a huge fan of, of a, lot, a lot of copper work a lot of outside frit or you know those kind of sandblasting too much just because i love the optics of glass and especially when you make a nice shape so that's really what I've strived for in the past five years is just to learn that that style. Yeah, I agree, man. I, I I'm the same way. Like I, that's why I like using clear so much, just because of the, just the glass. You know, it's just so pretty seeing yeah, that shit. You know, for sure, it's amazing. Yeah, I'm actually going through your page right now. Oh, nice. So, yeah, I definitely, I definitely am digging the 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 work you're doing with the drips on them. They're fun. 
Yeah, I wasn't sure how they'd be taken. You know, this the AIDS show in January was the first time I had any of that Storm Cloud series stuff. Um, but it was really well received. I took maybe 20 pendants. You know, I just do a pendant with it, and then I do the, um, the Storm Cloud tubes, and all the pendants got scooped up pretty pretty fast. And I've been taking orders on the on the Storm Cloud tubes. People have been liking those a lot. So yeah, I think it's going well. And the, I made the two of the drips in the middle of those storm clouds function, so there's a Jesus seal in between them, and so the, when they function, the smoke will go through two of the, the rain drips, which I think will create some cool effects. And then I hope to be able, hope to, be able to design a recycler out of it eventually, too, because I have smaller clouds that, that are non-functional that go around the main one, um, but I think that I could make those small ones functional so that they're, they act as the drain for the recycler. But again, that's one of those things where I haven't even really delved into. Um, Chris A. Halt and I made like a double headed elephant recycler and he's got a lathe. So that was a little bit more suitable for us to learn that, that idea and technique. But that was a learning experience for both of us. Just learning those, those seals and um, doing that sort of high scientific work. It's just not something I've tried to do yet because again, it takes a lot of a lot of knowledge just on the scientific side of things and yeah i don't want to screw it up you know <laughs> and like Dude. put something out in the world that doesn't isn't doesn't work right you know yeah uh, yeah and, and that's that was part of my issue getting started when i was first going was like i i would i would try to designate one day a week to have like a fuck off experiment day and i knew i was going to probably waste a bunch of material and glass and stuff but in my head i was like oh i'm wasting money in this shit I, you know i'm struggling as it is and i can't you know experiment right now but it should be the exact opposite. Don't be afraid to go in there and waste material, even if you do it all in clear. And like, there's, you just got to learn and practice. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's going to take time. It's going to take energy. It's going to take gas and glass to fuck it up. Mm-hmm. But I'm going through Chris's Instagram right now, dude. Holy fucking shit! You guys got to check this guy's thing out. His Instagram is uh, his, his chaw glass, but it's uh, Chris Aholt, A H A L T. Yeah. Unbelievable. I've seen his work uh, down south and down in Miami. His balloons that he does. Yeah, man, he's he's on a whole nother level, and he's he's a great example of that one of those guys who's been doing it for a long time. But he practiced Venetian vessel work for years, and he jokes about it all the time. How now all he, all he does is sculptural stuff. But those once he started doing those balloon animals, he done them for a long time, non-functional, just as art. And he had them in galleries and everything, and he just started making them into pipes. And we we actually shared a booth at that. Um, that Jan- January age show and it was his first pipe show and it was just crazy to watch like all the glass blowers that have been following him come over and talk to him and just you know bow down to him where a lot of the pipe industry the buyers they don't know who he is yet it's really funny to see that mm-hmm. but, but now he's going to blow up as far as the pipe scene goes he's going down to do a show at um, the Maid Gallery soon and stuff um, but yeah he's just an incredible sculptor yeah, I've seen the him and Ethan, Ethan Windy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, killer. Yeah, I need to get him on the show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a great dude, too. He's... Just to talk about, because the, the realism that goes into his sculptural work, you know, it's it, when you go into, like, with salt, for instance, you know, like that heavy, heavy carving that you do, mm-hmm. glass does not like that shit at all. <laughs> right. You know, and that's, you know, and, like, looking at the recycler you guys did with the uh, mm-hmm. the elephant, you know, it's like, the function on that is so unique, but just the just the look, the the look of the the two of you guys going together, I think it's a great example of like a true collaboration where you're taking two different artists, techniques and styles, and then merging them into one type of thing. You know, and I, th- I think with our industry, it's one of the unique things that we have going for us is the fact that we can collab and we can take our 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 voices and make a song out of it. You know, with each other in a sense. <clears throat> it's it's so unique, you know. I, I think it's cool too that we. I think it's kind of spawned, like some painters that we have in our community, um, that do some kind of like dab art, you know, I'll call it in a sense, that mm-hmm. are doing like collaborative paintings now that based on you know influence from the glass industry. Yeah, you know, but, I've actually seen some some tattoo artists do collab work too, which is something I've thought about. Um, it's another one of my interests and passions is tattoo art, but. Um, I always wondered why more people don't do that. You know, yeah. it's pro- it's partially probably because of proximity and, and cost and those different things. But yeah, it'd be so cool to see some different tattoo artists work together on pieces. You know, and get both of those techniques going in one one piece of art. Yeah, just like the painting stuff. Yeah. Do you actually tattoo your like do tattoos and stuff? 
I don't do them. I'm just a collector. <laughs> yeah, same with me. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's kind of interesting you're saying that. Years and years ago, I uh, opened up a gallery down here in St. Pete with a friend of mine. And the long-term goal was uh, we we're going to call the gallery Collaboration. And it was going to be a gallery dedicated to the art of collaboration. And uh, we had a publication that was going to go through with it. We, had, we were sharing it with an artist at the time. And this guy was a complete cocksucker, so it all fell through. Like, I just pulled out of it as fast as I could. But uh, it's still something that I'm passionate about because I, th I think, you know, it's it's the idea was to take different mediums and merge them together and make and make them work together. If they I'm not make them, but you know, if they they wanted to, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, take a metal artist with a wood artist and see what you guys come up with, and then have a show based on that kind of idea. Yeah. But you, but you don't really see it, you know, as 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 my ignorance, I should say, I don't see it that much. With with social media, it's given us a chance to really explore more of the arts out there. But uh, it's really heavily involved with our industry, which I think is is badass and there's people that don't like it necessarily i think it's one of the coolest things that we can do as a glass artist is to collab with each other this episode yeah, is also brought to you by green flash to... glass green flash glass yeah, is a small family too. owned florida based you know, business a crafting a high quality maybe. production I, I line of tubes all, they but, say their goal um, is to grow organically I just don't when you call really their number the, you speak to one of the owners the guts to maybe small put pop shop is producing a line of glass that is efficient and simple with clean lines, strong welds, but, and good feng shui. Um, you know, with over 25 years of combined experience in glass blowing, these guys are in it for the long haul. These deadheads are grateful for their current clients and are accepting new wholesale customers. Killer, man. For the month of March, they are offering 20% off all orders for new wholesale customers. Go follow these guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It will mean a lot to them. They're at Green Flash Glass everywhere you go. Independent, high quality craftsmanship, honest actions, bona fide. Green Flash Glass. All right, man. Well, let's get to crashing the kiln here. Something fun I like to do, and that's a quick fire round. Uh, we've got six questions for you, and uh, give me a 30 to 6 second answer on them. If you want to expound upon the answers, you can as well. So uh, if you're ready, man, let's go into it. And the first question I always like to ask, which is always a difficult one, is uh, because there's so many of us out there, if you could work with any living glass artist that you haven't worked with yet, who is it and why? Oh, man. So many. I haven't worked with nearly anybody yet, but... <laughs> Man, I I probably have to take it back to the 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 origins and say Adam G or Adam Graffis, uh, you know, he's the reason I started blowing glass. I owe I owe pretty much everything to him, and I know he's not doing all that much these days. Um, but definitely, I would say if I ever got to work with him and just yeah, just hang out with him and collab with him again someday, that'd be awesome. Hell yeah! What are your uh, top five favorite colors in glass? Oh. I'm definitely liking all the new transparents. Uh, like I said, I've been, I like the look of glass. So the transparent glass is a huge draw for me. So love the purple lollipop, um, raindrop, um, huge fan of aqua azul. Uh, it's such an awesome stable color. Uh, lemon drop in the crucible tube, uh, pulled stuff form. I'm not a fan of the rod, but the, the tubing is awesome. Hey dude, so quick second. I'm getting the, uh, Getting that static again. Oh, really? Somebody just texted me. I wonder if it had something to do with that. Still yeah. hearing it? Nope. Huh. I think that might be it. <laughs> Unless it maybe, are you shuffling your feet or something maybe? I don't know. It's, maybe your nope. mic's just like super sensitive. Yeah, I'm not moving at all. But... Huh. Weird. Maybe just sit really still for five minutes. <laughs> 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 Which is impossible for me. <laughs> Uh, okay, sorry, I'd interrupt you there. So, oh no problem. So, uh, yes, yeah, so you're saying about the crucible colors. Oh yeah, so the lemon drop tubing, and then I think I got one more. I will say, oh, pink lollipop. That's one of my favorite to use. Hell yeah! If you could uh, describe the sound of glass cracking in one word, what is it? Uh, tink. I'd say tink is the best way it sounds. Cool. Uh, what is your worst injury in the studio? Ooh, um, they probably all happened when I first started as far as burns and cuts and stuff. Uh, nothing super bad. I had a, when I was going to drop down to blow into a tube, um, my support hand, I was kind of in a vertical position. Um, my left hand, my support hand just let go for some reason. And the whole glob of glass that was in the middle for my bubble fell into my left hand. Mm -hmm. Um, that was pretty nasty just because it covered so much of my hand as far as the burn and the blister. Um, but I'd say probably the most painful is sticking your hand in the flame. There's something different about 
a glass burn as opposed to a flame burn. I think the flame burn hurts a lot more. So probably a good flame burn across across my right hand once. Um, and then most annoying, I would say, is uh, cutting my lip. I'm not very good at polishing my blow tubes, and I'll cut my lip, and it just doesn't stop bleeding because there's no way to get a Band-Aid on it or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm the same way. If I've got guests coming to the shop, I'll make sure that like, I have some for them that are polished. But, yeah, I never polish my blowpipes. And I, yeah. <laughs> habitually, I don't do it because I know that that end has not been heated before. Like I, all my punnies, all my tubes, <clears throat> I don't polish my ends just because I, it just lets me know that that end is cold. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Which is, yeah, it is, but then it's not because I cut myself. Yeah. <laughs> I don't burn myself, but I cut myself. <laughs> right. Oh, man. Yeah, and the worst, dude, like I, I remember one time with the blowpipe thing, I the glass had like a little nick on it, and I was just like rotating in my mouth, and it happened to like catch the inside of my lip and like brought it with the blowpipe kind of thing as cool. I was rotating my mouth, you know? Yeah, I was like, I pierced the inside of my lip, and I had to like, back it up to get it out of there to make sure oh. you know you know what i mean <clears throat> one of those dumb early on things yeah so yikes yeah, yeah. no fun so in the studio do you uh, watch tv listen to the radio or do you do both oh man i'm a little, a little bit across the board i'm a huge podcast person um but i run out of episodes a lot so one of my favorites anyway i listen to a lot of radio lab and this american life um and I've pretty much listened to everything full length on those. Also, Serial Podcast was a huge favorite of mine last year, last season. Um, so when I run out of those, I'll put music on, but I often get sick of my own music. Um, so I'll, I'll switch over to maybe like stand-up comedy. I'm a big fan of listening to Louis C.K. or Aziz and Sorry. Um, Heck yeah. <laughs> while I'm working, it's good to get a good laugh in there while you're working. Yeah, I've been on that same kind of role myself, going through Netflix and finding stand-up comedy stuff. Yeah. It's good shit. Listen to Tim Ferriss at all? Uh, no, I don't think so. Oh, yeah. The good, great podcast, man. The Tim Ferriss Show. Okay. Definitely. I recommend it to everybody. Check it out. Check a lot it out. of, uh, he wrote a book called The Four Hour Work Week. And oh, sure. Yeah, I figured of that. Yeah, yeah. All right, man. So, my last and final question for you, which is always a fun one. If you were stranded on an island, it could be any island of your choice that had a glass studio on there and you were only supplied with your gases, your kiln, and your torch, and you had to make something, what five items would you bring? Well, I've listened to this before, so I'm going to say, first off, my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, my glasses, I would probably bring tweezers, um, six mil punties, uh, some clear tubing, probably 50 mil, just because it's so versatile. You can stretch it down if you need to. Um, and then what was that three no that's four. actually four yep four um and then i would bring maybe a pair of jacks cool. cup jacks yeah oh yeah <clears throat> good shit yeah it's always <laughs> the glasses thing is always funny because i i think we're so used to wearing them all the time it's just one of those things we forget yeah you know like yeah. i think i've lived my life through a tent of some sort for the last 17 years <clears throat> whether it's been on the torch or driving around with my sunglasses on yeah, you know, I just changed. Um, I, I wore Shade 5s for a long time. Um, and they were lenses that were made for uh, frames that I had sent in. Um, I think it was from Philips or something. But it, they kind of had this weird optic thing going on. They were fine if I was looking at the flame. But if I looked up at all, I would have kind of felt like I was cross-eyed. Not, not from looking at the flame for too long. But it was just like the optics were off on the two lenses or something. And then I it sort of like put a lot of strain on my eyes. I would after a long day of work, and I would not be able to be able to see straight real good. So hmm. I recently switched over to some some different factory made ones, and they've been and shade threes too, which have been a lot nicer for to work with. Yeah, I think the shade fives are too dark for what we do. It definitely is going to cause you to have eye strain because you can't see anything else except for right. your bright flame. Yeah, unless you're working like quartz or something like that, then you need them because of the brightness of the glass. But yeah, I agree. Sure, hundred percent. Yeah. Well, cool, man. It's, uh, it's been a lot of fun chat chatting with you, and especially because you've only been doing this for five years, and definitely appreciate you sharing your experience and you know some good insights to to your experiences with the trade shows and you know just glass in general. So definitely appreciate having you on. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. This is super fun. Hell yeah, man. So before we let you go, though, if you want to uh, give us any kind of parting piece of advice, and then also where we can find you out there in the world of cyberspace. 
Sure. Yeah, I think we touched on a lot of things as far as advice for new glass blowers, but I think really what it comes down to is just being humble and taking taking as much learning experience as possible. That's something I haven't done is taking classes, and like you've said, I'd, I recommend doing that. Um, I think it'd be super helpful to just get some tips. There's probably some bad habits you can create if you don't take classes, and I maybe have some of those, but yeah, just... Uh, Learn the material. Don't try to sell stuff right away. Make make a make a life situation so you don't have to sell stuff right away if that's possible. Um, yeah. And then as far as ways to find me, social media, Instagram is where I really post everything. It's just at Crux Glass, C R U X. Um, yeah. And then it, that all links to Facebook too. If you don't have Instagram, but I think most people do at this point. Um, yeah, and then I'm doing that uh, Michigan Glass Project. If you're coming to that, come say hi. Yeah, that's probably it. Cool. Cool, man. Well, thanks again for coming on, and hope you all enjoy this episode with Adam, Mr. Crux Glass out there in the world, and uh, we will see you guys on the next episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. Y'all take it easy. Thanks, guys. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. If you have any questions, comments, or remarks, please leave them in the show notes page area where it says comments. We'll see you soon. Have a wise night.